to everyone who, yeah, who, who for inviting me and thanks for everyone who is both in the room and online now. And I'll first, uh, knowing that I'm mostly speaking to the economists, uh, scandalize the audience a bit by having no PowerPoint presentation and no screen sharing. Yeah, I know that it's not appropriate. Yeah, but as I tried to squeeze a rather long course in uh, one short talk, and recently found out that it's going to be even shorter than I imagined, yeah, it is. Uh, it would be impossible to do it with PowerPoint. Yeah, and secondly, uh, the topic of my talk uh, is that we are. I'll mostly speak about historical background. Um, I'll deal with the current events, but very shortly, and probably at the very end, if, if I'll have time, I'll be also happy to answer the questions about it. But one specific thing about this, the current war, is that it can in no way be explained by any economic interests, uh, not even remotely. And neither uh, did the people who initiated it ever believed it can be explained by the economic interests. It looks likely that they underestimated the economic damage, but clearly they were absolutely confident that the damage is going to be there. Yeah, and no, absolutely no benefits. So they had very different, clearly non-economic reasons for starting that. And thus, I'm giving one of the aspects which deals with uh, cultural mythology. And what uh, a couple of words, what I understand by cultural mythology, uh, I, it is the set of fundamental narratives uh, which persist in the mind of a huge majority or sometimes all members of the given community which in a way unite them and which do not have to be accepted, shared. Yeah, that's why I'm not speaking about ideology because you can accept ideology, you can yeah, believe in it, yeah, you can hate it, but these are un semi-conscious sphere of the way how you perceive the world, which is underlying any ideology, and in a way, ideology can be successful and operative only if it fits and degrees with this set of underlying cultural myths. And uh, so, uh, there are different spheres, different from where this mythology emerges. I'll mostly focus on several of them. One is religion, the basic religion perception, not so much uh, the dogmatic part as the practice, practice part of religion. Secondly, uh, historical narratives. Once again, not what really happened in history. Sometimes we have no idea what really happened. Yeah, but uh, how it is perceived, thought, and what people assume they know about. And thirdly, great art. Once again, speaking of great art, I'm not speaking about its uh, actual merits. Who knows what art is great? We have different tastes in art and what is not great. But I speak only about its importance in forming the national psyche, its readability, its part in the school curriculum, and other things like this. And so uh, there are a huge set of Russian cultural myths, no way uh, to squeeze all them in a short talk. I'll do just three of those, uh, they, which are interconnected. And start by the first one, which I consider arguably the Ur mythology, the basic myth from which everything else springs out and which defines everything else. It is the concept of what I say of the transformational leap 
and of coming uh, from being the most backward to the position of utmost leader. Uh, it is the vision, in a way, based in the general Christian theology uh, yeah, of the last becoming the first. Yeah, it's understandable to the people who know Christianity, but in Russian history, gradually, it became, it deals not only with individual humans, like described by the Gospels, but with a nation of hope. Russians traditionally would easily and without any problems agree with their countries backwards. Everybody speak about Russia as a backward country, uh, sometimes dramatically overstating its backwardness. Yeah, when you say uh, is uh, uh, economists would understand me that Russia is a mid-developed country and not extremely backward, actually it mostly will be is going to be taken as an offense. We surely have to be the absolute worst in the in the absolute uh, yeah, background of everyone. But that not only does not contradict, but means actually defines that we have the glorious future and are going to become the leaders and the most well in some spiritual at least sense the masters of the world showing uh, the way to the whole humanity and not so much sometimes it is this vision is interpreted as we are going uh, we are the last but in spite of this, we are going to be the first, but most likely, most traditional interpretation is we are the last, and because of this, we are going to be the first. There is immediate and direct connection between the both. Uh, if you um, come to the center of Moscow, right across the, near the entrance gate uh, to the Kremlin, the place where the government enters, uh, the Kremlin, you have the huge eight meters statue to the Kievan Prince Vladimir, the legendary founder of Russia. And uh, it, it was meant to be 16 meters high, but then UNESCO said that the Kremlin will be expelled from the World Heritage if you have a 16 meter monument. So it was downsized to eight meters, big enough. Yeah, and uh, so the important thing about it, uh, it was erected not long ago. Uh, it didn't hurt that he's the namesake with the, of the current president. It also was important that he's a Kiev in France and Kiev was the old capital of Russia. So it meant claim that Kiev, Kievan legacy is the part of the general Russian legacy. I'll speak briefly about it later. But one uh, important, the most important thing I would say is the personality of Prince Vladimir, as we know about him. Well, we know next to nothing about Prince Vladimir, but how his uh, hagiography is written about, the life he's a saint, and not only the saint, but of the first rank of saints, in Russian it's called Ravna Apostolny, equal to the apostles of Simkons, he's the savior and enlightener of Russia, who brought Christianity to Russia in 988. And also in all Russian chronicles, we read the same narrative on which most of the Russian were fed up and fed were and uh, yeah, uh, brought up. And uh, so what we read, everything written about Vladimir was written a century and a half later. So we really don't know what, what, what was his real life. But what we know about him is that very clearly that his first biographers and hagiographers who wanted to make him a glorious figure shining in the Russian annals didn't make the smallest effort to reduce or to downplay his criminality of his youth. 
he's shown in the Chronicles of Hagiography as the worst imaginable sinner. Yeah, mass murder, horrifying rape, raping his future wife yeah, in the eyes of her father, and then killing the father in the eyes of his daughter, including the martyrdom of a lot of young Christians whom he killed in schools. And it is the founder and uh, the greatest saint, one of the greatest, the first Russian national saint. The important thing is that the people, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. But what we know that the people who write about it didn't try to uh, somehow to forget about it or to downplay it. Because the greater is uh, his sins, the more, more evil he was before he converted to Christianity, the greater is his shine and glory afterwards. That allows him to become a real saint by completely renouncing. Yeah, he, he accepts Christianity and he completely transforms himself from the worst imaginable sinner to the incredible saintlyhood. Uh, it is a part of the Russian Orthodox soteriology, the doctrine of salvation implicit in the Russian uh, church, which unlike West Christianity, Catholicism didn't have purgatory. You, uh, after death, and what happens, what you expect to happen to you after death is very important for a practical life. Uh, after death, you're faced with the dilemma of hell or paradise, salvation or damnation. And as we know that most of the people are not completely holy, nor neither completely sinful. So what you can aspire for, we are all sinful. We can aspire only on the imminent grace of God and especially of God Mother. You pray to God Mother, and she asked his son and whether he will really say no to your mother. Maybe she'll be nice enough and, uh, and accept your prayers and then the son would not refuse your place in hell. Yeah, the, through the whole history of religious disciplining in the Western Europe, we know the, the confession strategy, weekly confessions, yeah, meetings in congregations of believers and confessing in your sins and whatever. Russian government struggled immensely to make uh, its subjects confess once a year. It was the maximum it could aspire for, and it was not done. And mostly it was also for the fiscal reasons. I'm not going to explain now what the fiscal reasons were. Uh, no, we can deal with it later. The people didn't want to do it even yearly. What's the use? Now I'll confess, and tomorrow I'll sin again. Then again, confess, yeah, it's absolutely senseless procedure. It's worth confessing once, immediately before death. And that's, that's going to work. You confess all your sins at once, and you go uh, probably to heaven, maybe not. But who, who knows? Because it's absolutely not dependent on what your eternal salvation, on what you do here. It is. You just aspire, and maybe God's mother is going to help you. By the way, in the Western tradition, Mary, of course, is mostly referred as virgin. In the Russian tradition, she's mostly Bogomatir. Her motherhood is the most important thing. Uh, I've been several times many times in my youth actually visited a Russian monastery. Yeah, if Russia would have been still open, I would strongly recommend it. Of Pichora in the northwestern part of Russia. Yeah, and it was, was not vandalized by the Bolsheviks because in the time of vandalization, it was on the territory of Estonia. And so it was well preserved, unlike many other monasteries, but you can see a lot. So you come there, and in my youth, the travel was from the nearby city of Pskov, three hours, 
on a horrifying bus, on a horrifying road, you are jammed to death. Uh, the uh, bus jumps on every stop. Yeah, the smell is terrible. And you make it like three hours in 11 o'clock in the morning, you come to the little town of Pichura. And by 11 o'clock in the morning, everyone around, irrespective of age and gender, is already drunk. And you come out and you see this landscape. And then there is a monastery, you walk. Uh, and in spring and in autumn, you're up to your knees in mud. Yeah, in summer in dust, in winter in snow. Then you walk under the arch, which is enormously deep and long. You walk under the arch and you pass it. And the moment you pass the arch, you're immediately in paradise. Yeah, the beauty is absolutely stunning and incredible. Everything is painted in bright colors. If it's, uh, there are a lot of flowers in the season. Uh, uh, in the winter, the snow is shining white. Yeah, the cupolas are gold. Yeah, it's, it's totally amazing. Yeah, and it took me several times, uh, several visits, to understand that all of it is not a side effect. It's all meant as a complex. In order to feel this heavenly relief, and joining and saving your soul, you have to go through all these stages of upcoming there. Yeah, uh, now I was said, well, before the war, it was slightly improved for touristic reasons, but this, of course, ruins the effect. Uh, and this is this vision of complete, total, and absolute transformation. You take everything out of yourself and you go up. And in many ways, this perception is, uh, defines Russian military history as well. Some countries, most of the countries, well, war is an essential part of most of the national narratives. And most of the countries celebrate victories. There are several countries like Serbia and Armenia, they celebrate defeats. Russia celebrates defeat turned into victory. First, you have to start by the horrifying defeat, and then you come to incredible and absolute triumph. And the whole story of major Russian wars, which are the part of the narrative, is exactly structured like this. In 17th century, there is Polish, Harrison, and Moscow, then it's swept away by the national militia. And in some time, Russia partitions Poland, the new dynasty comes on the throne and so on and so forth. In the 19th century, French occupy Moscow, Moscow burns, the war ends in Paris, Russian troops take Paris in 1814. All of it resonates in, of course, the most important war in the Russian national uh, narrative, uh, the what Russians know as Great Patriotic War uh, and in the West, which is known as World War II, which starts with the horrifying defeats of 1941. The Germans did not, unlike the Poles and the French, occupy Moscow, but they came very, very close to it on the uh, one short distance. And then finally, they were defeated, beaten, and Berlin was taken. And the part of it, not only it starts with the horrifying defeat, which put country on the verge of annihilation, but and ends in cosmic and absolute triumph. Long time ago, I used to talk to American businessmen, give them an introductory lecture on Russian culture. And I said to them, you know, you deal with your Russian partners and the Russian people in general, and you can be very reasonably open yeah, and relaxed. Yeah, if you'll say to Russians, everything is bad here, they say, oh, sure. Yeah, you don't know how, really how bad it is. If you say you, your government doesn't function, they say, yeah, it's much worse than you imagine. Uh, and so on and so forth. You can even say that, you know, Russian people are lazy and inefficient. They say, yeah, yeah, exactly, we are like this. Yeah, but please, Never say that you Americans have won the war. This, you, you may get uh, murdered. 
Yeah, if you mention something like this, just please. Yeah, uh, to my absolute astonishment, the answer I got to this was why. And then uh, I became totally numb. Shit. Because we wanted to make you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's absolutely clear. Yeah, but the part of it is this idea that of incredible amount of sacrifice. Millions and millions and millions of people were put on the altar, killed and sacrificed. And that's which makes this such a basic event in national memory. Uh, and uh, this vision was reflected in many um, not only in wars, but also in huge national transformations. Uh, well, we had a revolution of 1917, the communists came to power and Lenin, the leader of the revolution, he was a dogmatic Marxist and he knew Marx very well. Certainly he was very well aware of Marxism as a theory. Uh, but, uh, and he knew that the socialist revolution may come only according to Marx when the uh, forces of pro pro productive forces will contradict the relations of production. So in a well-developed capitalist country, that's the only uh, condition where socialist revolution may happen, happen. And Lenin, who studied Marx through his entire life, said, no, no the socialist revolution is going to happen in the weakest link of the capitalist country, meaning Russia. Yeah, he didn't, uh, he, he believed it will, Russia which will ignite the socialist revolution. Start and th thus becomes the natural leader and the beacon of the world. That's only one example. Many of the sort can be brought up. And Coming to art, there is, I believe, yeah, I can give dozens of examples. We can speak of Dostoevsky, other major writers, but I'll limit myself just to one. And it is, from my point of view, the single most important text ever written in Russian. It's the Gogol's novel, The Dead Cells. And the Dead Cells is, of course, an oxymoron itself. Yeah, every Christian, and Gogol was a fanatical Christian, knows the soul is immortal. Yeah, but he speaks is a special attack, attack in the Russian serfdom when serfs were counted in cells. But what is it? He portrays Russia as the country of dead souls. It is the people who souls are dead. And it is an absolutely devastating, unbelievable uh, portrayal of the country, which many critics at the time took uh, so as the most horrifying slander. And then the story ends, a uh, main character who is a swindler, escapes from the town where his swindle uh, comes to the open and he may be persecuted for, for it. And he runs away on a carriage, Troika, three horse carriage, on a Russian road, which is definitely horrifying. Yeah, and you can't ride too fast on it, absolutely. And then he's taken aback by the speed because every Russian rise loves a fast ride. And the whole of this novel ends by the glory to Russia, the pen the Russia which runs like this unstoppable three horse carriage. Yeah, no one can beat her. The air comes into pieces and other nations and state uh, stay asunder and give it the way. So the Russia comes to the utmost from this utterly desperate condition, which is dramatically exaggerating, which is a terrible satire, but it comes to this near paradisical future. 
Um, but what are or what can be the conditions? What do you need in order to effectuate such an incredible transformation? It's the mission of Russia to transform itself this way, but what, what do you need? A lot. But I'll limit myself today to two aspects. One thing is you need a leader. A person who unites in the moment of trouble, unites the country and is able to change the defeat into victory, to transform the defeat into victory. A uh, Russian political system mostly is portrayed, referred to as a uh, personalistic, one word, and monarchical. It speaks of Putin's monarchy. It is definitely a personalistic, but it's not in the least monarchical. There is nothing remotely resembling monarchy as we know it because monarchy is, first of all, monarchy is about the succession. If the king is dead, long live the king. It's all, the, not that uh, the monarchical countries don't know dynastical crisis, they happen, but it's a violation. Basically, monarchy is about the way of succession. Uh, in Russia, in most of the cases, uh, before the ruling emperor or president or general secretary of the communist party passes away, nobody knows who's going to succeed him. Yeah, it is always an inbuilt crisis point. And to my best knowledge, never in Russian history, uh, the, there was orderly successions more than two times in a row. And if we speak in Weberian categories, a Russian system of power is not traditional, but charismatic. It is very powerfully charismatic. It build, built completely upon the personal qualities of the ruler. And thus, uh, the czar, the ruler, can be not legitimate or illegitimate. It's not a question at all whether he's legitimate. Nobody cares. He can be true or false. Some others are true, some others are false, they're pretenders. And it can be shown only by what you do. If there is a false czar, there is a time of troubles. Strong people, the boyars, tear the country in pieces. Uh, they are the favorites, they are military defeats, and uh, there is the feeling of the lack of leadership. Uh, with a true czar, he turns military defeats into military victories, as I said it, and the bigger the defeats are, like Peter the Great's de defeat in Narva in the beginning of the Swedish war, the collapse, of Russian army or Stalin's defeat in the autumn of 1941 and so on and so forth. Yeah, the bigger the defeats are, the more glory comes to the final with the final victory. You get rid of the strong people. There be, yeah, because there is one country is person in place and one ruler. Uh, one interesting thing of it that the true Russian leader is not allowed to have a family life. Gorbachev was universally hated for the role his wife played in the system, not because you know, she was specifically important, but because you are not supposed. Yeah, the true leader is married to the country. You can't have any other wife. So yeah, Ivan the Terrible sent his wife in the monastery. Yeah, well, Peter the Great did more or less the same. Yeah, with his wife and so on and so forth. Yeah, I can speak 
within this mythological character of his marriage policy. Yeah, we know that Stalin's wife committed suicide and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, family life, yeah, because your only commitment is the country. You can't have a family. Yeah, Russian, major Russian observers actually physically murdered their own children. Ivan the Terrible did it, Peter the Great did it. Yeah, Stalin was told to uh, refuse uh, the, his son was captured during the World War II. And by the Nazis, yeah, and according to the legend, I don't believe it ever happened, but the legend takes it this way. He was uh, suggested to change him for the field marshal, German field marshal, arrested in, in Stalingrad, and he said, we don't exchange soldiers for field marshals. So in a way, it was also a murder of your own child, because there had been no family. And uh, the important thing also about the Russian ruler is that the charisma lies not in the position, but in the person. Ivan the Terrible rejected his throne, left here. Peter made all these uh, masquerades, walked around, he left the country, yeah, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you show that it's not your role as a monarch, not a seminar role. It's not institutional. It's purely personal. You don't have even to have position. Yes, yeah, Stalin is known never to sign any document as the first or the general secretary of the Communist Party. He said the secretary of the Communist Party. Yeah, there were many secretaries, but he said secretary, everybody knew that it's Stalin. Yeah, you don't need the title. Yeah, and especially that the secretaries of the Communist Party nominally were even not head of states. Yeah, the, 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 there was another head of state, nobody cared about it. Uh, so that's about the leader. But that is not enough because the leader has to lead someone. And you need what is called Narod, the nation. And of course, Russian Narod is the notion which cannot be translated in English at all. The English doesn't have the concept. Neither the people work, neither the nation nothing remotely similar. Though, like many other terms of Russian political and cultural philosophy, it neat, neatly works in German. It is folk. Uh, yeah, the idea of folk very clearly uh, refers to this, not nation, but folk. And the whole idea of the nation as an organic body, as a human being, very relevant for this vision. Nation is a human, unified human being, organic human being, and it was invented, of course, in Germany. It has a German origin, and politically, it was the reason going behind the idea of the unification of Germany in the late 18th, early 19th century. Germany was spread and divided in many countries, and German nationalists invented this idea of Germanness go, going about the local identities, the German, the Deutsche identity, yeah, uh, the famous Nazi hymn having the line Deutschland über alles didn't mean actually initially when in the 19th century it was written that Germany should rule over all nations, but meant that any German has to put his German identity over his Thuringian, Schwabian, Bavarian, or I don't know, other identity of the of, of the German land. So that's the idea. But Russia, unlike Germany, which was a divided religiously country in the Protestant and the Catholic regions, and politically, it was a unified empire, a multi-ethnic empire, but it borrowed the same vision of the nation, of the nation history, of the nation past, mostly to oppose French cultural dominance in Europe, like it was done in Germany. But uh, Russian divisions went mostly by the time along the social lines, not so much along the national lines, but along the social lines, uh, because culturally 
the elite of the society, completely and utterly westernized since the reforms of Peter the Great, who totally belonged to the European cultural world. You have French, uh, uh, the Parisians in 1814 were expecting for the barbarian hordes and were absolutely stunned by the exquisite ancien regime French of the Russian officers who came uh, to Paris and visited Académie Française, yeah, meetings, Parisian theaters, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and uh, so that was this absolutely westernized elite and the huge population, culturally completely different from it, regarding the elite mostly as something totally alien to them and knowing that the nobles, the barrier, they are more powerful, but we are much smarter than they. And uh, that was the traditional attitude. And Narod, unlike the nation, was the intellectual construction of the elite, meaning these people who were looked for them like a sort of undifferentiated enigma. Yeah, sometimes despised, sometimes adored, sometimes idolized, sometimes inspiring guilt. But there is the whole vision that Narod is elsewhere. It, it is somewhere, it is, we are not the part of it. Uh, nobody of the high society would ever think of themselves as a part of Narod. Yeah, there is, uh, was a famous Russian revolutionary activity, the revolutionary group called the populists, who were uh, engaging is what they called Hashdenia of Narod, going into the people. So they went to the villages, trying to instigate rebellion, to educate, to help the peasants, to enlighten them according to their tastes. But I think the only thing which is important, uh, the movement completely failed. Mostly uh, the peasants arrested them and handed them, them, them to authorities. Yeah, but uh, what interests me here is mostly the grammar. Where they previously, before they start going into the nation, where they are actually located before they go into the nation. They are definitely outside of it. Yeah, to go into something, you have to be located outside. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay, I'll manage it in five minutes. Yeah, and thus you have this vision of totally enigmatic nation not actually of human beings, but a sort of mystical body existing in Russia from the days it immemorial to the present day. And the leader becomes the leader of this, not of the actual citizens, actual population of the country, but of this mystical unity, which he has somehow mystically transformed. And finally, yeah, in the last five minutes, I want to connect everything which I think is not a difficult thing to do after all I said, but to put the dots on the eyes and to connect with what currently happening. Uh, Russia's defeat in the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union was reinterpreted the official propaganda, not as the liberation of Russia from communism, but as uh, the ploy of the cunning West, which managed to dissect the unified Russian nation, the organic body of the Russian nation in several distinct bodies. Yeah, and the Russian nation constitutes, of course, of three different ethnic groups, which are in 19th century, the word Ruski, Russians meant all three of them, which were subdivided into the great Russians, who we know today, Velikorosa as Ruskia, into little Russians, which we know today as Ukrainse, Malarosa, and into white Russians, which we know as Belarusi. But the whole vision that it is the three branches of the single nation. So when Russian invasion into Ukraine is described as imperial, it has some imperial future. No, it's not completely wrong, but that's a dramatic oversimplification of the situation. 
It's not Russians see Ukrainians not as the other country and other nation which has to be subjugated, but as the traitors who betray their Russian, uh, Russian essence. They are Russians, but they are spoiled and deceived by the ill-meaning West, by the Poles, by the Americans forever in not accepting and not understanding their own Russians. And in order to do this, you need a leader having no family, having previously liquidated the boyers and the oligarchs, uh, or de 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 of the political influence, ended in the official narrative the time of troubles and the 90s uh, are considered after the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union is considered as the time of troubles and is going to resurrect the body of the nation. In the Russian folk tales, uh, there is the story that the giant, the great giant is not only killed but dissected. His hands and legs are cut off. In order to bring him back to life, you need first to unite his body together. And you do it using the dead water. You pour on him the dead water. And then after his body, after you pour the dead water, is stuck together, you pour the life water, and he comes back into life. So the whole vision of the current war is pouring over the dissected body of the Russian nation, the dead water of the war, before finally resurrecting it. And just to end the story, a glimpse, one minute glimpse, on the other side of the frontier. Of course, Ukrainian political mythology and cultural mythology is not only different, it's just absolutely opposite. It's all built not on the vision of personalistic leadership, but on the vision of military democracy, the Cossack democracy, the Cossack mythology of the military yeah, male world, zealed around themselves, yeah, self-elected nation, in the constant state of war, coming from the different places in the siege. Yeah, uh, I can't really imagine of the political visions and the historical narratives, which would have possibly more different than actually Russian and Ukrainian. Yeah, and now I think the history and the history has unlimited resources to teach its lessons even to the most obstinate people. So I think everyone, a lot of people have already realized it, and finally everyone is we're going to be around to see it. We're going to realize that Russians and Ukrainians are actually and eventually two very different nations completely. The problem is you know, teacher, uh, history always succeeds in teaching it lessons. The problem is who and how much pays for the tutorials. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. And um, I guess many things now are just becoming more understandable, honestly, I, because it, it, like everything that was, um, that we were talked about, it was not in, 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 in narrative right now. And uh, in this case, like history uh, definitely matters. So the so I I am just wanted to ask whether we have like any question here in the audience or online first. I'm just checking. Yeah. <laughs> so any questions? Yeah, Jonathan. Thank you very much for the, for the talk. So kind of hints at this the end, but it sounds a lot like your story is about the kind of ethnic Russians, I suppose. So I was wondering where the rest of Russia now has been, like the Far East or the Caucasus. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Or are they part of this? Yeah. Uh, you know, yes. Uh, uh, there are other people who belong to Russian Federation 
and who used to be the part of the Russian Empire. And the, the Tatars, who are the, the biggest ethnic and religious minority, there are the Muslim or nations of the Northern Caucasus, there are other ethnic groups here in the East, like Yakuts and Burats and so on. The problem with them, of course, how they're different, are that nobody actually perceives them as Russians. They're clearly seen as the minorities. They belong to the state. Yeah, well, when Chechnya tried to secede in late 90s and to uh, Uz, yeah, they were discussed and separatist. They want to separate themselves. Yeah, and everyone understood that, well, we, it's purely imperial. Yeah, we are, we uh, have for some geopolitical reasons to keep this territory and they want to secede and to separate themselves. Yeah, but uh, nobody would describe, describe Ukrainians as separatists. They're traitors. They're not separatists. Yeah, in a way, it resembles what happened in 18th century with Poles, who were saying, well, they're Slavs like us. They speak nearly the same language, but they are seduced by the ill-meaning Vatican. And Vatican converted them into Catholicism and they started renouncing their Slavdom. But by now in two centuries, yeah, that's over. Yeah, nobody in Russia would ever say anything about Poles as the same nation. Everyone knows that Poles are different. Yeah, it's completely done with. Though in late 18th, early 19th century, there was a lot of discourse that we're basically the same. Yeah, Ukrainians, of course, they're most predominantly, there are some units and other predominantly Orthodox. So it is even more difficult. But yes, uh, now they're seen to be the part of the same national body, which is not only, I would say, going to change, it is changing already. It's visibly changing. But you need a you know, the sport to do it. Yeah, something I'm curious about um, the, the way you spoke about this mythology and how deep it runs in the national psyche of this self conception of nationhood that we don't really have in the English language. This war then, now, it seems both inevitable but also deeply historically continuing. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about those two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, well, I would not say inevitable. Yeah, and I don't believe in historical fatalism. Yeah, what I would can say that, and it proved it was possible. Yeah, there are some uh, outcomes that are not possible, there are some outcomes of possible. Well, Russia had a chance to accept the fact that these are the different country. In the 90s, after the secession of Ukraine, they could say, well, what can we do about it? Yeah, they wanted that way. And it seemed it's going to happen. Yeah, then we can, uh, uh, we can analyze what actual events what complications, yeah, why uh, it, it turned so dramatically yeah, to the absolutely revanchist doctrine. Yeah, and also to what extent the majority of the population share this yeah, uh, militant, mystical, and actually Nazi view of what's going on. Yeah, current mobilization, I think, and the course of it, Look, it looks like that most of the population would sort of agree with it, with all this worldview. They said, yes, yeah, that's more or less correct, but not to the level of really sacrificing their life for this idea. So it could have turned the other way around. I'm not sure. Uh, no, I don't think it was inevitable. Definitely, there it was possible and probable, and because of this, it, it turned this way. Uh, and then the natural uh, cultural morphologists are not involved; they are not genetical. They come and they go. They are, yeah. I don't want to sound like a essentialist. Yeah, and 
it might be if Russia and the world are going to survive, uh, which is not a given, that everything I'm talking about will be completely changed. We saw how Japanese mythology turned uh, completely changed after Hiroshima or the German after 1945. So yeah, cultural myths uh, are born and die as well. So it is possible. So I would not, but about the development here, I won't probably to capitalize on the fact that I'm giving this talk in Denmark. Yeah, and there is a famous saying, which is often attributed, I don't know to what extent correctly, to Niels Bohr, who said, never make predictions, especially of the future. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, because before you mentioned that there is one more myth in, in Russian, this like mytho mythology in general, it's connected with vodka. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I never said that there is one more myth. There is no, I mean, set. one more that I'm just curious about because I know that it's part of cultural tradition, but I really can't get how it could be a part of this myth, like mythology as a cultural oh, concept. Very easily. It's the transcendence. Yeah, you transcend your possibility. Yeah, and then, you know, yeah. Uh, once I was utterly puzzled coming to St. Petersburg with the bus loads of Finns coming uh, to St. Petersburg to get dead drunk. Yeah, and I uh, asked my Finnish friend whether that's commercially viable. Really, does it pay? Could uh, the money you have to pay for vodka there in St. Petersburg be so different? I said, nothing at all. It's, yeah, you don't understand how Finnish men, and it's like in Russia, predominantly male thing, yeah, how uh, uh, they drink uh, and what they boast after drinking. They said, yeah, I drink just a tiny amount. That was completely drunk already lying on the tree. Yeah, a Russian man is going to say, yeah, I drank three bottles of vodka and then drove a car, yeah, went to see my girlfriend and had wonderful sex and so on and so forth. Yeah, and you come to fight. You come to fight in the battle where you're definitely going to be defeated because there is no man in the world which can drink all vodka. Finally, you, you'll be on the floor. But you, your heroism is measured by the time and the amount you still spend on the battlefield before inevitable defeat. Of course, the defeat, yeah. Who, who can win? The forces of the enemy are overwhelming. But you do, you try your best, you show your masculinity in the process. Yes, yeah, so, and it has, of course, yes, this fatalism, this belief in yourself, uh, the courage, yeah, and all, all other things here. Yeah. I, I can give another lecture, but I'm afraid I don't have time. Thank you. Honestly, I, don't, I, didn't, I really didn't think that it's that that it's battle. So yeah. I didn't <laughs> see it this way. Uh, so uh, do we have any other questions? There's nothing online. Okay. Um, so then one more question that I wanted to ask. Um, so if um, we, so but what you told right now, it's our current way of understanding like history. Is it possible that our understanding and like, for example, what is connected with um, um, this definition of nation and thing could be rethought? I mean, is it methodologically only one way to think about it? Or are there any other options to, to explain, for example, what it means to be like Russian nation or not? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I think out all people around, you know me for a while, yeah, and you wouldn't suspect me of believing that there is methodologically one way of doing something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, never. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course there are a lot of ways to see it. Uh, you can, uh, well, uh, there is a political way to understand the nation, yeah, people you're having this, uh, the passports of the specific country. Yeah, but this understanding 
rather common in current, is mostly implies political democracy. Yeah, because we all are citizens of this country, we are political body because we are vote. We choose the government here, and politically, yeah, it's the background for the democratic perception. Yeah, there, there is an ethnic vision of the country. Yeah, you can see we have the same heritage, ethnicity, we speak this language and whatever, which doesn't work well in Russia as well, because it's multi-ethnic empire. And in a way, Russians traditionally were not so keen on ethnicity. Yeah, uh, like it is the nation you can join by choice. Yeah, uh, you can join some, you can't join others. That's, that may be different out of your choice. Yeah, but here, Russian definitely, yeah, you can become Russian. Yeah, if you choose, yeah, that's that's a possibility, but you you have to to invest in it emotionally, culturally, yeah, whatever, yeah, the criteria can be different. So uh, I think in a way, yes, it is uh, the the perception you you think of it in terms of shared mythologies. Uh, when I gave some lectures of this course in Russia, I did it a lot of time. This myth I rarely do many gen together, but separate here. And I found rather similar reactions. Uh, the people who are ethnic Russians and who identify themselves as Russians are more or less happy. They never object. Uh, somebody, sometimes uh, they may not agree with this or that point, but they don't see anything uh, uh, offensive. But I found out that the people coming from Russian minorities, the Tatars, the Bashkirs, we hope who are in the audience, often ask, the, become enormously nervous. Yeah, and often ask the organizers, why do you bring us to such an anti-Russian rant and whatever talk and whatever? And then, yeah, I, uh, I'm also always asked, well, do you like this culture? Yeah, and I said, well, it's not a problem whether I like it or not, it's mine. <laughs> whether I like it or not, it's, a, it's not an issue at all. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just really think that um, this explanation is the most powerful, like the, the explanation that you provided. And I mean, there, so my point was that, yes, there are other explanations, but they're not um, explained that much as this particular like way of uh, dealing with uh, present, uh, present and past. Yeah, but it might change. It might change. Hopefully. <laughs> might change. So that's... Yeah, um, it will change. You know, you know you're, what's going on is you reach the stage which I think the changes are inevitable if are, it will not end in the total annihilation of humanity, which is also not completely uh, a non-existing option. Always yeah. good to end on a cheerful note. Always good to end on a cheerful note. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, for the talk um, and thank you, uh, yes, uh, the, time, the, the timing. Yes, uh, and time, yeah. time is perfect. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So. Yeah.